to see so many people out tonight. I'm glad you could find your way here in the fog. I understand it's pretty, pretty treacherous out there. So, um, so welcome to our nice, warm, lighted library. Uh, it's wonderful to have everybody together again um, and to be able to welcome you on behalf of Brooks Memorial Library. My name is Starla Shronica. I'm the director. And this is our first Wednesday event, Pandemic Architecture, Two Centuries of Disease and Design. And for many of us, architecture took on a whole new context and, um, and significance once we were locked inside. <laughs> and then once we could finally go outside again, um, I, speaking for myself, I had developed a whole new appreciation of, of my surroundings. So, um, so I'm really excited about this program tonight. And I would like to extend our thanks to our partners at Vermont Humanities Council. And we have with us Noel Clark. Noel, where are we? There he is. He came all the way from the Vermont Humanities to, um, to experience this program this evening as well. And of course, our generous underwriters who make it possible for us to offer such rich and robust pro programming. The sponsor of our entire first Wednesday season is the Vermont Department of Libraries and the Institution of, or, or the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And of course, this series, our Brattleboro series, is completely funded by your friends and mine, the Friends of Brooks Memorial Library. So, um, those of you, and I know you're all friends. Um, may be receiving their annual appeal letter sometime uh, this month, and so I hope you'll remember how much fun you have at these programs. Um, so tonight, we come together to listen, to learn, and to be inspired in community. But before we begin, I do have a few announcements. First of all, Vermont Humanities would really, really, really appreciate it if you would check in for this event. Um, so we do have these QR codes posted around, uh, around the front desk back there. And so you can scan this and enter your email address and you'll get a feedback form that you can fill out. If you prefer not to do that, I am happy to take your email and send that on to Vermont Humanities Council and I'll put this clipboard at the table up here for, uh, for that convenience. And um, I also want you to notice that we are having a book sale, in case you missed that, and some fabulous raffle baskets. And again, though, all the proceeds will support the friends who support these programs. Um, and I wanted to let you know that we have some other programs coming up, not the least of which are more First Wednesdays. But for the next three months, so in January, February, and March, all the First Wednesdays events will be virtual so that you don't have to deal with fog or cold or rainy nights or driving uh, late at night or on ice. So you can sit back, have a cup of tea, have a glass of wine, and um, we'll all come together online. But before that happens, we do have some events here at the library. We are having a community discussion on homelessness, which will take place a week from tonight at, from 6 to 8. We will have a special after hours event the following day with many of our elected officials. And this is a climate action and advocacy tour that um, our local representatives will be participating in a discussion. And then we will continue our last program on the Buddha and politics uh, the following week. So I am delighted with all these papers to, uh, at this point, introduce our speaker, David Mills, who is Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies and Dean of the Core Division and International Education at Champlain College in Burlington. His research and teaching explore the intersections of philosophy, religion, art, and architecture. And I'm so looking forward to this presentation. Um, and I'm hoping that maybe I will gain some insights into our lovely building that is over 50 years old. So, Professor Mills. Thank you, Star. Am I yeah. here? Okay, good. <laughs> 
So thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm excited because this is the first in-person one of these I've done in now several years. I did a few of the virtual ones, and while those are great and do give us access to some folks who might not otherwise join us, this is so much fun. So thank you for being here. Um, and uh, since I've gone to the dark side of full-time administration at Champlain uh, five years ago now, uh, I don't get to teach. Uh, and I love teaching, and so this is like a gift to me that you've given me the opportunity to sort of be in a classroom again. So thanks for joining me in this space, um, and I look forward to exploring some of these ideas uh, tonight. So the first thing I want to do is give you a complicated piece of vocabulary that you can use to impress friends and relatives or drive them away, uh, as the case may be. The word is palimpsest. Have you heard this one before? Yeah. Star has. Okay. So palimpsest is, it comes to us from the Middle Ages when paper was extremely rare and they used actual things like goat skin to write with, right? To write on instead of paper. And because it was so time intensive to create a piece of vellum out of the skin of an animal, it was an incredibly rare commodity. And if you needed to write something down, sometimes the best thing to do would be to scrape off the ink from what someone else had written on the page and write your new stuff on it. So a palimpsest is one of these old pages where you can see the remnants of what had been on there before. And you see the sort of underwriting, uh, whereas something else has been written new on top of it. And sometimes these things just have layer upon layer upon layer. And with our new technologies of cat scans and all that sort of stuff, you can just see these layers of, of text and things that people thought was important enough to write down in a time when that was incredibly rare to do, and you get the sense of this evolving, changing conversation over time on this page. Now, I'm starting a conversation about architecture by referring to medieval manuscripts because I want us to think collectively about our cities, our built environment, as though it's like one of these pages. It changes, right? Buildings get torn down. Sometimes they get moved up the street. Sometimes they get modified, altered. So if you drive through downtown Brattleboro, it's telling you a story. And you can see when the economy was good and when it crashed. You can see when there were natural disasters, fires and floods and so forth, that change that landscape and alter what is written on the page. So, so think of this image here of a, it's a city scene in London. And you can see multiple layers of the city developing over time, sort of like the text on that page, right? So here's some very old uh, buildings going back centuries, flanked to the back by these contemporary buildings that have been built in the last few decades, and you can see modifications. Something was torn down here, something was painted over here, changes were brought. Here's a scene from New York City. If you're familiar with the High Line, that public park that was built on an old elevated rail line. Oops. You can still see the vestiges of what was a, an important piece of infrastructure at one time in New York City, and now it's become an important piece of public space and a uh, common area. And then again, you can see multiple generations, some Art Deco, some earlier stuff, some newer stuff, some really new stuff, right? So every time we're looking at the environment around us, we're seeing these layers of history. They're telling us a story of what was important to people at a certain time and a certain place how they were going about living their lives. So I want that to be kind of the lens that we're using to think about how uh, pandemics, like the one that we're working our way through right now, uh, have affected us in this context of the built environment, the spaces that we inhabit, the streetscapes that we navigate through. How have those borne the mark of those sorts of changes? How has the text changed over time? Okay. So we're going to travel through a couple of centuries real quickly. And let me give you one other sort of mental image to use as we do so. Anytime culture changes, and we mark these historical epochs, like the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, modernism, the Enlightenment, right? It's not like people wake up on a Tuesday and say, you know what, I'm done being ancient. It's time to be modern. <laughs> Let's rebirth something today, shall we? Like, no, right? These things happen gradually and slowly over time, and then only with hindsight do we look back and say, this was the Renaissance, and it was from this year to this year, and of course that's artificial, right? So as we think about cultural transformation and shifting of time through history, think of it like pressure on a fiber rope. Think of those two ends being pulled in opposite directions by contrary forces, 
And over time, ping, 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 some of those fibers start to break, while others of them are still attached, right? So if we look at a time like the Renaissance, we can find continuities with the Middle Ages, and we can find discontinuities, right? Some things are radically different than they used to be. Some things are still very much the same. So again, let's think of that as a lens to use as we look at how the text of the city is changing. Where are the continuities? Where are the disruptions? What do we see as we drive through Brattleboro or New York City or anything? How has the events that we've been living through put the stress on that rope? What's broken? What's the same? Where are we in that story? Okay. So one of the particular through lines that I want us to trace through this uh, fraying rope is... Um, the concept that architecture and urban design have always been connected with questions of health, questions of purity, questions of us and them. So I want to focus on that particular strand of the rope. Who is the other and how are they treated? What is purity versus contamination? Not just as a biological category, thinking about germs, viruses, and bacteria, but also thinking about people. And if you've been paying attention these past few years, those things have been wound up together, right? With certain populations being treated certain ways because of associations and assumptions about disease and how it spreads and where it starts and all that, right? So how is that played out through the built environment? And I think we'll find that those threads are, are gonna carry with us. So let's go back in time start in the 1800s. Uh, this is a, an etching that was illustrating an event uh, in London in 1858 called the Great Stink. Now, we could start any time in history and we're going to see waves of disease come and go. There were cholera outbreaks and typhus and flu in 1833 and 1837 and on and on, you know, London and the major population centers of Europe were facing these challenges. But in 1858, it got so bad because they were dumping their sewage straight into the Thames River, right? Like just open sewage flowing through the center of the streets of London, eventually finding its way into the river. And it was so gross that the air was literally choking you uh, in the summer of 1858. High temperatures in July and August in particular, they called it the miasma. I mean, that's just a very evocative word. Of that's the air you're trying to breathe. You think of like smog in Los Angeles or something. Amp that up with the smell of open sewage, right? And so the assumption was the air itself was what was causing diseases like cholera to spread ferociously through London at this time. And so they had to figure out a way of cleaning the air. And the best way to clean the air was to clean the river, which was the source of the stinky air, right? So this guy, um, whose name is Joseph, I got a try to pronounce this, Basel Gets, um, was commissioned by the city of London to design new sewers. So they constructed these giant brick tunnels all over the city uh, to catch the, the sewage that was coming out of the, the properties, still didn't have indoor plumbing in a lot of these places, and, and send it much further down the river where it would eventually dump uh, at the mouth of the Thames at high tide, so the tide, as it retreated, would take it out to open sea. And lo and behold, this cleaned up the Thames River and resulted in a dramatic drop in cholera cases. So this was done in 1866, and in 1867 there was another cholera outbreak, but it was confined to East London, which was not connected to the sewers yet. So they were like, sweet, problem solved. We conquered the miasma. You can now breathe clean, clean air. Well, now we know, of course, that it was the water itself that was transmitting the cholera, right? People were drinking the water from that river that was so awful that you couldn't breathe next to it. Nonetheless, wrong theory, right outcome. This guy probably saved more lives in London in the 1800s than anyone else uh, in, in the city uh, administration or otherwise at the time. In Paris, a similar thing happened. Uh, this guy... Uh, again, pronouncing non-U.S. names, George Eugene Hausman, um, redesigned the city of Paris. How many of you have seen Les Mis as a musical or a movie? 
and Mr. Rob, or read the book, uh, by Victor Hugo. You know how the barricades were built up and the, the stage setting for that musical, it's all ramshackle and close quarters and wonky looking buildings. That's the way the medieval streets of Paris really were. They were a rabbit's warren of tiny little streets meandering through a hodgepodge of buildings that were falling over and it was a mess and disease was rampant. Uh, again, open sewers, no uh, effective hygiene. And so uh, Houseman was commissioned by Napoleon to clean this mess up. And so, I mean, here's some quick pictures of some of the areas of that city, the old medieval uh, sections of Paris. And here's an impressionist painting of Paris as we think of it today, right? These broad boulevards, central fountains, beautiful, these are called Houseman style apartments and so forth. He cleaned up Paris. But here's actually what's interesting, and here's where we start to see that pattern that I want us to pay attention to. The redesign of Paris was not just about public hygiene. It was about moving those populations out and making sure they couldn't revolt against the emperor again, like is so celebrated in the story of Les Mis, right? It's much harder to build a barricade here <laughs> than in one of these narrow streets, right? And in fact, the barricades were made not out of furniture and so forth, like it shows us in the musical. They were made out of these cobblestones, which were sometimes wood and sometimes granite or, or, or other rock. And uh, the revolutionaries dug these out of the street and stacked them up and built fortified walls out of them across these streets. And they made nice ammunition to lob at uh, the officers who were approaching you with muskets and so forth. So it was actually really hard to police that population. It was really hard to enforce the interest of the ruling class in these spaces. And so Hausmann designed these streets so that an army could occupy the center of these intersections and have clear, unobstructed cannon fire lines down these broad boulevards. And you could march an entire cavalry down one of these boulevards with very little that could stand in your way. And he removed all the paving stones. The streets of Paris were paved in this fine granite dust at this time, which you couldn't build a barricade out of, couldn't turn into a weapon. So, so notice, like, he was celebrated as a public health victory, but it was also a public control victory. And there's always this intersection. Who is blamed for the outbreak of disease? What do we do to actually try to conquer that disease? Here's what Mark Twain said about Hausmann at the time. He is annihilating the crooked streets and building in their stead noble boulevards as straight as an arrow. Avenues which a cannonball could traverse from end to end without meeting an obstruction more irresistible, irresistible than the flesh and bones of men. Boulevards whose stately edifices will never afford refuges and plotting places for starving, discontented revolution breeders. The mobs used to riot there, but they must seek other rallying points in future. And this ingenious Napoleon paves the streets of his great cities with a smooth, compact composition of asphaltum and sand. No more barricades of flagstones. No more assaulting his majesty's troops with cobbles. Mark Twain got it, right? He understood what was going on. So we see changes in, in London. We see similar transformations in Paris. How about closer to home? New York City at this time. It's a picture of one of the tenement houses of the slums of New York uh, in the 1800s. And in 1800, in, uh, in New York City, these kinds of uh, structures were quite common. They were serviced by shared outhouses of roughly 30 people to a stall. Uh, not good odds <laughs> uh, for public hygiene, right? There were 100,000 horses in New York City at this time that left a collective total of 3 million pounds of manure on the streets of New York every day. So again, think about the public health implications of this number of people crammed into these conditions. What do you do about this? Well, um, yeah, there's some of the horses. You think New York City traffic is bad today. <laughs> Not a yellow cat in sight, and it's still a mess, right? So uh, this fellow, Frederick Law Olmsted, um, if you know your Vermont landscape history, you'll recognize him as the designer of Shelburne Farms up in uh, Shelburne, uh, just south of Burlington there an estate for the Vanderbilt family. Uh, he did commission work for 
wealthy folks. And he's the designer of New York City's Central Park. You may think of Central Park as like the way the island of Manhattan looked like before it was developed. No, no, no. They tore down tenement houses and other properties to create this park. It's completely artificial. It's entirely man-made, lakes, hills, plantings, everything about it is calculated. And it was considered the lungs of the city. The city was so clogged with noxious fumes and so forth, people needed a place to go and breathe air that had been cleaned by trees and water and these sorts of things. Other parks, Prospect Park in Brooklyn and others were developed at this time for the same reason. But as we saw in Paris and as we saw in London, it was the, the poor and typically immigrant classes in New York who were blamed for the problems. So here's a picture of some children in what were called the lung blocks of New York City. These were principally Italian immigrant communities at the time, uh, and they were considered the source of all the problems in New York. So we're going to build parks far away from them, where the wealthier residents of New York can go breathe something, and we're going to do something about these folks who are clogging up our air to begin with. That was the overall philosophy. So this is one of the first publicly funded housing projects, public housing projects, called Knickerbocker uh, City in New York. And um, they just cleared out uh, these pre-existing Italian immigrant uh, communities and built this giant, it's called Knickerbocker Village, not uh, city. Um, it's, a, it's a garden apartment model. So the whole thing is like an enclosed ring with this park-like space in the center. Now, crucially, they weren't designing it for these families. These families had to go somewhere else because they couldn't afford to live here any longer. Instead, a newly emerging middle class moved into these garden apartments and it became a source of uh, significant wealth generation um, for a different sort of population. Over time, rent increases fourfold in the Knickerbocker village. The original residents are eventually rehomed or dispersed, not rehomed. And then interestingly, today it's predominantly a uh, Chinese immigrant community. Uh, so it's still in some ways a segregated uh, ethnic enclave, just as it was back in the day, but for a different population. And the landowner just a few years ago installed uh, facial recognition software systems to control access to the building. And if you do any sort of reading about technology of this kind, you'll know that there are some serious challenges with things like facial recognition software around racial identity and the differences in skin tone, face structure, etc. A lot of these companies built their software testing it only on white people. And it turns out like it doesn't actually sense skin of different colors or faces with different compositional structures. And so some of the residents of this very housing complex now have trouble accessing their own homes and the landlord never consulted them. So again, questions of access health, who's to blame, how do we fix the problem, right? You can see how these are all wrapped up together. Uh, and these are just any number of, these are just a few of any number of examples that uh, we could talk about uh, to, to demonstrate this sort of pattern. So the pattern is improvements benefit a newly developing middle class and others in power, say Napoleon in Paris, and relocate the poor, the immigrants, those who are blamed for problems. Now, closer to home here, Brattleboro actually benefited from some of these trends. Uh, if you've done any research into your history of your town here, you'll know of this uh, entity called the Wesselhoff Water Cure. Mm. Um, and the belief was, with these congested, filthy cities, the reason so many people were getting sick is that they didn't have access to nature. So it was much the same philosophy as the design of Central Park for New York, this guy started this uh, institute here in Brattleboro. This was at the corner of Elliott and Church. Church. Uh, I think there's a fire station there now, is that right? Yeah. So that's what used to be where your fire station is. Uh, things have changed, right? The, the vellum got erased and something new got written down, right? So uh, he started this institute and the idea was you needed exercise, you needed a ton of water. So, I mean, the people who enrolled in this program, they just drank water all day. You think, you know, the craze of carrying around a water bottle and drinking a gallon a day or something, nothing. It's been around since the 1840s. So, um, and things were bad, right? I mean, life expectancy was like 40. 
Uh, one in five children died before the age of one. Um, doctors were using things like leaching and mercury to try to cure people. So, like, props to Wesselhoff for thinking maybe there's a different way. Maybe we can work with nature instead of against it. Um, so, fresh air, exercise, healthy food, community, lots of water. They did the whole dunk in cold water for an extended period of time, which is all the rage these days as well. They took lots of walks. Two-thirds of the patients were women. It became a very popular place for Victorian women to go where they had a lot, they, they had very few opportunities and freedoms in their normal life, but if they came here, it was segregated by sex, and so the women and the men were separated, and the women had lots of free time, uh, and it was kind of lovely for them. Um, it cost about $10 a week, which would be about four to $500 a week in today's money. So, I mean, not, not cheap, right? So not just anyone can afford this, the wealthy come up from New York, they come up from Boston. Uh, when the rail line is put into Br Brattleboro in the 1840s, what was it, 1849 maybe, um, the train came to Brattleboro, this became the most famous, the most expensive, the most well-known across the country. Uh, there were a number of these water cure resorts around the country, but this was the cream of the crop. So famous people who uh, came here, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Stonewall Jackson, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Martin Van Buren, Francis Parkman, like lots of celebrities in the 19th century, hung out in little old Brattleboro trying to get healthy because the cities were killing them, was the thing, right? Now, one of the guys who worked with um, Besselhoff was uh, Dr. C.W. Grau, who was one of the doctors who attended to folks here. And uh, because walking was such an important part of the regimen, he became a cartographer. Um, and, and actually a really good one. So this is one of his early maps of Brattleboro. And uh, I want to point out a couple things here. Uh, just to give you some reference points, this would be Western Avenue, High Street, Route 9, right? <laughs> and there's Linden coming down. Uh, anyone know what that is? The dotted line? See how well you know your aerial maps of your own town. Uh, Oak Street. Close. Yeah. <laughs> Different tree. <laughs> Doesn't narrow it down much for Brattleboro. <laughs> oh, it would be uh, Bruce Tree or Street? Cedar. 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 Yeah. Cedar. If you look at a contemporary map, like pull up Google Maps or whatever, you'll see that Cedar Street follows that dotted line. That was a walking trail for the residents of the, the Vesselhof Water Cure facility, where they did their daily regimen of walking to get themselves healthy uh, because of the toxicity of the cities that they had come from. So this is one of those places where you can see the vestiges of the past and the present, right? There's still that underlayer of writing visible on that document page, even though we've written all sorts of new things on it, you can still see the reason Cedar Street has the sort of meandering trail that it does, goes back to this concern for health and overcoming disease that drove a lot of the economic development in Brattleboro in the mid to late 1800s. A couple of other things of interest on here. Um, gypsy ground. Gypsy. Now that's a, a term that's considered a slur in today's vocabulary. Uh, the preferred term in Europe the, for the folks who used to get referenced by this term is Romani. Uh, but we had no Romani people. Those would be folks from Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Eastern Europe um, that were treated that way in Europe. They're obviously not hanging out in Brattleboro. Who do you suppose was referred to with this term in the 1800s here? The natives? Native Americans, the Abenaki. This was, I mean, if you go, so like, um, what is it called, Retreat Farm? Mm -hmm. It's right around here. There's a sign there that gives you the original place name that the Abenakis used to reference that very location. Um, the term is? Wantastikuk. Say it again. Wantastikuk. Awesome, yes, uh, which means uh, the place where you come to the river where things get lost. You've heard it. Oh, yeah. Pull it apart as fully as possible. Um, and I'm not sure anyone knows exactly why that's the, the name, but uh, that was the place name for this locale. These folks had been driven off of that land, but they were allowed to come back and set up uh, sort of craft fair booths and sell things like um, bark, baskets and woven sweetgrass 
and, and these sorts of things that were their native handicrafts. Uh, so they were allowed to congregate there, and folks from Radabur would go out and buy wares from them, but they couldn't live there any longer. So again, see the pattern, right? Wealthy folks from the cities are hanging out in Brattleboro, getting healthy, walking across land that was once upon a time the homeland of the Abenaki people who have been moved off of it so that wealthy New Yorkers and Bostonians can focus on drinking lots of water and taking cold baths and having lovely rural walks, right? Yeah. Same pattern, over and over and over again, right? Other interesting thing on the map here, yeah, yeah, asylum, right? Still there today, right? Oh, yeah. In one form or another. Yeah. So here's the, uh, a more contemporary picture of the Brattleboro Retreat. Here's one of the, this is probably the first daguerreotype photograph ever developed in the state of Vermont, and it's of the Brattleboro Retreat. You can see the structure back there in the background, and here's some of the patients of the retreat hanging out on the lawns. This was uh, inaugurated in 1840. Uh, 34 as the Brattleboro Retreat for the Mentally Ill, or the Vermont Asylum for the Insane. It went under various names, and it was renamed the Brattleboro Retreat, full stop, in the late 1800s. It was the first one in Vermont. It was one of the first 10 private uh, mental hospitals in the United States. Uh, it was modeled on a similar institute in England called the York Retreat, which was founded by Quakers. Um, and the philosophy that drove this came to drive this, and it was in contrast to the prevailing understanding of mental illness at the time, which was that mentally ill people are, are just, they are not rational beings any longer. If they ever were, they are now more akin to animals, and really it's about containment, control. Uh, so this is uh, the new Bethlehem Hospital, or the Bethlehem Royal Hospital in London, and if you say the word Bethlehem in a good Cockney accent, it comes out like Bedlam. <laughs> Heard the term Bedlam before? Mm -hmm. What does the word Bedlam refer to? <laughs> What's it evoke? Agitation. Chaos. Agitation, chaos. Yeah. Insane asylum, right? So here's a, an etching by William Hogarth from the Rake's Progress in the uh, 1700s uh, that shows a scene from inside Bedlam Hospital. And yeah, it's a little grainy on this. Uh, check it out sometime. Uh, zoom in on the details. You see just chaos, right? There's people playing musical instruments. There's people draped across the floor. There's people just doing inscrutable things. There was no attempt to treat, to cure, to any of these things, right? So um, going back to here, or maybe I can go forward. Was I thinking ahead? I was thinking ahead, and I put it on the next slide. Uh, so the York Retreat, and then subsequently the Brattleboro Retreat, were modeled on the belief the Quakers had this principle called inner light, belief that each of us have a connection to the divine. So if you've ever been to a Quaker or a friend's uh, meeting house to one of their worship services, they will sit in silence until someone's inner light needs to speak. So they don't have a pastor who gives a homily or a priest who leads uh, a mass or anything. It's all of us are connected to the divine and one day it's you who speaks, and one day it's you who speaks, and maybe one day none of us will speak. But So their retreat was modeled on this idea that each of us have this inner light that needs to be brought again to the fore. So the mentally ill have that light as much as anyone does, and so they focused on humane and moral treatment. They focused on rural environments, something very similar to the water cure facility, right? Get them out into nature, get them involved in healthy exercise. So the, the retreat tower in your little hiking area over there was built by uh, patients of the Brattleboro Retreat as an exercise in healthy physical activity. It didn't have any purpose other than they need something constructive to do, and that's part of their, their cure. So, um, there's a lot more we could say about the Retreat Center, but I'll, I'll hold it for now. If you're really interested in the history of the treatment of mental illness, read... Uh, Foucault's Madness and Civilization. It's a fascinating account of how reason and unreason are treated throughout European history with the birth of the asylum and the birth of the clinic and then eventually talking cures and forms of therapy. How madness is once again segregated off from just as the immigrant communities were segregated off, just as 
the Abenaki were segregated, segregated off, right? There's always this population of the others that we need to move out of the way so that we can do what we need to do, whoever we happens to be, right? Again, even if it's done with the greatest of motivation of curing or healing or, or so on, it still occurs in a separated off sort of space. And the geography of Brattleboro is testament to uh, some of those efforts uh, in the 19th century. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the city of Chicago, because you can really see this pattern in sharp relief in Chicago. Chicago had the same sort of problem as London, uh, and as New York, and that was open sewage dumping into the primary river, which fed their primary source of drinking water. Bad combo when it comes to public health, right? So they tried a number of things. Um, first of all, they uh, employed a, a bunch of uh, immigrant laborers, primarily from China, to tunnel under Lake Michigan two miles out and build a water inlet out there. So if you've ever been to to Chicago, then up uh, Michigan Avenue, and you see the water tower um, on Michigan Avenue that's connected to this inlet source two miles out. It worked for a while, and then heavy spring rains pushed all the sewage right out into the intake, and had the same problem all over again. So they hired this guy who designed the, the T in Boston. Um, he was a major civil engineer, so he was an expert in tunneling under things and building infrastructure. So they brought him out to Chicago and said, we need you to fix our problems in Chicago. So what he did, I should put this slide next, um, he jacked up the entire city of Chicago by like 40 feet without disrupting daily business. So like, this is a hotel, it's the Palmer House Hotel, it's a Hilton Hotel today. There's people staying in there, eating in the dining room, and outside, it's really hard to see on this etching, but there's fascinating pictures. There's a bunch of men all around the perimeter of this giant stone hotel that's like eight stories tall, and they each have a jack, and when the foreman blows the whistle, they all do quarter turn. And then just, you know, centimeter by centimeter, that thing grows. Enough that they could then lay an entire sewer system underneath the entire city of Chicago. So they achieved that. We're dumping it freely into the river. Then it hit the intake. So they still had problems, they bring him back. His next big move is to reverse the flow of the Chicago River. <laughs> so, we need to dump this stuff somewhere. We don't want it dumping into Lake Michigan where it's going to get into our drinking water again, so we need to send the river another way. So they dredge out the entire, they redirect the Chicago River, dredge it out so that it flows opposite of what it would normally do and dumps into the Mississippi. <laughs> kind of brilliant as an engineering feat, but what's the yeah. what's the downside? Uh, the poor people who live in the Mississippi don't want to live downstream, right? Like somebody lives there, right? That stuff isn't just magically <coughs> disappearing, as far as the Chicagoans are concerned. It is, yeah. but if you're now on the other side of Chicago, between them and the Mississippi, you got a whole new problem on your hands, mm -hmm. right? Can you see the pattern? Amazing modern technology applied to this massive engineering undertaking of building sewers, redirecting rivers, trudging tunnels, and all this sort of thing. Rather than addressing the problem at the source, which was our patterns of consumption and all of that, just send the problem to someone else. Make it go away, as far as we're concerned. So, that way of thinking prevails. Like, Chesbro was a hero in Chicago and globally for having accomplished what he did in Chicago. No one thought to interview the folks down there. Um, so as we roll into the 1900s, optimism is running high. Sorry, my notes just disappeared. So um, you've got Edison, um, and uh, pictured with him is Lewis Howard Latimer. I don't know if that's a name that's uh, familiar to you. He's one of the most prolific inventors and patent holders in US history. Edison's light bulb would not have existed as a commercial product if not for Latimer, a person of color who's almost never mentioned in uh, the historical records, because while Edison figured out the filament, it was so fragile that it couldn't be mass produced. Latimer figured out how to reliably replicate the carbon filament structure so that it could actually be produced as a commercial product. Uh, we wouldn't have electric lights in the same way that we do without Latimer's work. 
Again, Edison gets all the credit. So Edison's like the, the saint, the hero of the early 20th century. Electric street lights are going up across the cities of the world. This is a, uh, a benefit for public health because it's a safety factor, right? Um, Henry Ford's uh, assembly line production of the Model T uh, is celebrated as, uh, again, just a harbinger of an amazing future for us all. Incidentally, he learned his methods for building the car in the slaughterhouses of Chicago. A big part of the grossness in the Chicago River came from, you know the name Swift? Swift Premium Sausage. Swift and company had a slaughterhouse there. Uh, so did Armour. Um, trying to think of some of the other names. But they, they slaughtered these hogs. It went from like live animal to uh, fully packaged and on a refrigerated train car in minutes. It was a masterpiece of efficient disassembly. <laughs> uh, and uh, Ford was reading about this and captivated by it and went and studied their methods and sort of reverse engineered it to put things together and sort of take things apart. Um, so coming into the 20th century, we've got these amazing technologies. In the world of architecture, the big change is steel frame architecture. So. Any, most of the old buildings in the downtown section of Brattleboro, they're only three or four stories high, right? Mm -hmm. That's because all the load-bearing walls of those buildings are made of stone or timber. The outside walls of the building, these big, thick stone blocks, are bearing the weight of everything above them. Anything built from, like, 1900 on, any stone facade you see is actually just, like, wrapping paper on a, a Christmas present. What's bearing the weight is underneath there, and it's a skeleton of steel, like you see going up anywhere you look at a construction project these days, right? So that technology is invented um, and put to great use post-Chicago fire uh, by the likes of Lewis Sullivan. Um, and so these are some of the earliest skyscrapers uh, that are generated there in this time. So we've got electricity, we've got mass production factories, we've got steel frame architecture, and so you see everyone just assume the 20th century is going to be awesome. We're going to conquer everything that confronts us. Diseases, urban design problems, you name it, we got this. So uh, some of the artists who best expressed this at the time are called the Futurists. It's an Italian movement. Giacomo Bala paints this picture of an electric street light, and it looks like a religious icon. Like it evokes this medieval Virgin Mary sort of compositional structure. He's worshiping at the Edison Ball instead of at the altar of the Holy Trinity, right? Um, Umberto Boccioni, the city rises. Still a lot of horses in the city in the early 1900s. The cars are coming along, but he's, he's given us this horse that is just rising like a pegasus with its yoke looking like a wing, and in the background you can see skyscrapers going up. Uh, the city is just full of possibility. Nothing is going to stop us. And then, of course... We stop ourselves, right? Yep. With the onset of the First World War. I don't know if you realize this, but like the early skirmishes of what we now call World War I, everyone thought this would be over in like a week. Uh, <laughs> members of polite society are going out to watch. It was a form of entertainment. Like these sorts of skirmishes had happened enough in European history. Everyone thought this would be like one of those. There'd be some volleys of brightly dressed soldiers, and we'd sign some agreements and trade a few boundary markers on some land. And that. It's a picture of women in Paris, you know, petticoats and parasols out there in the cow pastures watching the soldiers. And instead, years later, trench warfare, machine guns, airplanes, chemical warfare, like <laughs> so many weapons of mass destruction that simply hadn't been conceived prior to this point transformed the landscape of Europe. So Paul Nash was a landscape artist. You can find lovely pictures of woods and sunsets and so forth from him prior to World War I. And he continues to document the landscape during the war as it transforms into this sort of horrifying scene. At the same time, disease ravages Europe and then the US. The so-called Spanish flu, which didn't originate in Spain, but actually somewhere in Kansas. Um, and was primarily transmitted by soldiers coming to and from the battlefields of, of World War I. So you can read the accounts of Brattleboro's own history with this flu epidemic in the 1918, 1919. About 40 people died, which was a good chunk of the population of Brattleboro at the time. 
but it was brought up from Boston by soldiers who were in the harbor there, and one of them came home to visit relatives in Vernon, and then it was off and running. Um, and that kind of story was spread, and 1.8 million people died. Uh, so, we're killing each other en masse in the battlefields of Europe, supposedly the bastion of reason and civilization. Meanwhile, disease is ravaging us, and we are not sure how to stop it. But if you probably saw references to this pandemic during our most recent pandemic, right? There's pictures of people in the 19 teens wearing masks on the streets and signs encouraging hand washing. And it feels like, wow, deja vu all over again. Uh, some of the interesting things that emerged. Um, something called a cure cottage. Saranac Lake over in New York State has a bunch of these that still survive. People would travel once again, get this theme, get out of the city, these congested, disease-laden places, get into nature. They were all equipped with sleeping porches. I rented an apartment in Burlington once that had one of these. Uh, and you could sleep outdoors surrounded by screens uh, so that you were breathing pure air uh, while you slept. And this was meant to cure not only the flu, but tuberculosis, and other diseases that were in circulation. My home in Burlington was built in 1922, and the radiators in my home are way too big for the spaces they're meant to heat. They are massive chunks of iron. And it was a steam system which ran even hotter than the water system which has been converted to. And uh, looking into why, it's because it was built just a few years after this flu epidemic, and they sized the heating system with the expectation you were gonna have your windows open all year round to keep that fresh air circulating. You weren't going to be trapped in enclosed spaces with toxic air. So you'll find these in a ton of New York City apartments. No doubt homes here in Brattleboro built during that time have the same features. In my home, they've tried to paint them to subdue the amount of heat they put out. They still crank. Um, so here again, you can see those lines of text written on the page, even though many things have been written over it since then. The past is still with us. So coming out of this, just absolute slam from war, from disease, the very technologies that we thought would save us are now being leveraged to kill us in greater numbers than ever. We can't seem to leverage that technology to beat this disease that is ravaging us. Compare these two statues. Mm -hmm. Fall of Man, 1915, versus you know this guy, right? Mm -hmm. Michelangelo's David. Just talk to me about the differences. How would you, what words would you use here versus there? Just, just shout out. No need to raise a hand. Uh, muscular and youth. Good. Well-defined musculature, yeah. strong and, and youthful. Fragility versus um, muscle, but also confidence. Good. Fragility versus muscle and what the muscle bespeaks, which is a confidence. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, Michelangelo violated the ideal canon that was established for the human body. Polycletus in ancient Greece had defined exactly like the relative size of the head in relation to the rest of the body. The body should be seven head lengths and, and these sorts of things. He's intentionally made the head too big and the hands are too big. <laughs> to speak of the city of Florence's ability to think for itself and to do for itself, this is a very confident. This is, if you know the story of David and Goliath, this is David who's fully capable of taking on a giant all on his own, no worries, right? Other observations? Giving up versus looking forward. Good. Yeah. He's gazing into that middle distance. He has his eyes fixed on something he's working toward. Notice how the head is like the lowest part of the body here. And that the, the visual curve drives you down, right? So it's this giving up posture. I see <clears throat> submission and assertion. Good. Mm -hmm. Submission and assertion. Yeah. So, coming out of this First World War and then rapid fire Second World War, the civilizations that had invested themselves so heavily in modern technology and reason and all of these things are caught scratching their collective heads saying, what happened? <laughs> How in the name of enlightenment did we become so barbaric? How do we prevent this from happening? Now, there's a lot of folks trying to answer these questions in the middle 20th century and beyond. In the arts, you can see movements like Dada and Surrealism are trying to address this. I'm not going to focus there tonight. I want to focus on this third group of folks, because they have more direct influence on architecture. Uh, a school called Bauhaus, uh, a movement called Der Stiel, 
um, and what has come to be known as the international style of architecture, which we are sitting in the middle of right now uh, in this lovely building. So maybe you've seen this on a shower curtain at Target or something. Uh, <laughs> it was created by Piet Mondrian as part of Gestil, this movement in uh, the Netherlands and then eventually across the rest of Europe, to go back to basics of what was most objectively real and true. The, the theory was we didn't fail ourselves in modern world wars because we were in, because reason itself is the problem. We were insufficiently rational. We focused on the things that separate us. So if you look at architecture going into the world wars, if I showed you a picture of a Spanish building, a French building, a Russian building, a German building, you could name which one was which, right? Each one had a sort of nationalist style and history. They're like, we were too proud to be German or American or Japanese or British or what have you, right? And in the name of those differences, we tore each other apart. We need to focus on what we have in common. And here's what we have in common, math. Two plus two is four, no matter what country you're from. No matter what language you speak, a square is a square. The, the essential definition of what makes a square is an objective universal truth, regardless of your history, your gender, your race, your national identity, your religious beliefs, etc. right? So Theo van Doesburg, one of the members of this group, said this, the square was for us as the cross was for early Christians. Think about that for a second. Like, what does that cross mean when you see it at the front of a Christian church? Softening. Say again? Softening. Softening? Yeah. It, it means a lot of things, right? I mean, it speaks of the crucifixion of Jesus yeah. Christ, right? And so to a Christian, it speaks of a way of life, a set of beliefs, a set of values, a set of hopes for the future, all these sorts of things, right? And these guys said, well, the square does that for us. The square is objective, it's rational, it's universal, it's regular, it's all the things that we need to be. So they started making paintings that were all reduced to primary colors, and purity of geometry. They started building buildings that looked like three-dimensional versions of those paintings. So this is the famous Jared Rietveld uh, designed the Schroeder House in 1924. 1924, by the way. Like, I don't know what your sort of mental map of architecture is, but like, the first time I realized these buildings were built in 1924, kind of blew my mind, because I think Art Deco, you know, earlier Edwardian sort of stuff, well, they're building this kind of thing right in the middle of it. And look at how rational. So again, here's this theme of purity. We're stripping down the basics. We're getting rid of the things that divide us and cause us to go to war. We're finding the purity that we all have in common. This is the rebuilt chair. I think it looks wildly uncomfortable. It's just like <laughs> straight planes of wood. But the message is, like, if you're uncomfortable in the chair, you're the problem. Not the chair. The chair is rational. <laughs> Side comment. I was noticing a big honking radiator under the window across from the chair. Exactly. I think of the apartment. 1924. Yeah. yeah, good eye. Absolute continuity there, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a different design. Um, so this is a school called the Bauhaus, and maybe you've heard of Bauhaus as a font, or maybe the rock group, the Bauhaus <laughs> man who let the dogs out. Anyway, uh, that has nothing to do with this, but the font does. You're seeing the Bauhaus font there on the building. Uh, this was a, a merger of a fine arts school and an industrial design school uh, that started in Dessau, Germany, and eventually they fled Hitler's uh, encroachments in World War II and eventually ended up in the United States. Um, they were convinced that the solution to the First World War was mass production of these strictly rational objects. Everything from typefaces to silverware to clothing to automobiles to furniture to the houses themselves. So their work was to build prototypes which would then be mass produced using the same technologies that had built the bombs and the airplanes in World War I. It would now be used to create pure, perfect specimens of rational chairness <laughs> or couchness or whatever, right? I mean, you've seen this furniture. It's actually beautiful stuff. The irony is it's still absurdly expensive. Like, to get a true Barcelona day bed will set you back, like, $30,000. Now, there's knockoff copies at places like Design for Everyone, Ikea, Target's getting in on this. 
kind of thing. You've seen these styles, right? But uh, ironically, they become affiliated with an elevated taste and an elevated budget, uh, more than the mass production of this is for everyone that the Bauhaus founders believed it would be. But here is the kind of ideal home they believed we should be living in. And they modeled a lot of this on healthcare facilities. This is a sanatorium for tuberculosis. It was built in the 1920s. It's just the next iteration of the, the Brattleboro retreat applied to the 20th century's wave of diseases and design philosophies. So modern hospital design, tile hallways, a lot of white, like everything looks clean, right? Starts here. And gets picked up in interior home design at the same time. So here's a typical Victorian bathroom. I mean, it just looks like a haven for germs, right? All that wood and fabric and that. But here's a 1920s modernist international style bathroom. Some of the first application of porcelain tile in a domestic bathroom. And like, if you're like me, I'm like, well, of course you want tile in your bathroom. Not prior to this, you didn't, right? The tile looks dirtier. Well, so it does by our modern standards, and it's part because it's now 100 years old. Um, but uh, yes, technique has improved. Yeah, I find that crusty. Uh, but uh, <laughs> at the time, it was radically clean by comparison to what was going on over here. This guy, Le Corbusier, a famous French architect. Uh, that's actually a nickname. It means the crow-like one. Uh, and you can see it, right? If you wonder why architects wear cool glasses, he's your guy. Um, actually, star hats. Yeah, the Corbusier glasses, yeah. <laughs> so let me give you a quote from Le Corbusier. We must create the mass production spirit, the spirit of mass producing houses, the spirit of living in mass production houses, the spirit of conceiving mass production houses. We shall arrive at the house machine, the mass production house healthy, and morally so too, and beautiful in the same way that the working tools and instruments that accompany our existence are beautiful. Health and moral health linked together. He believes if we live in that house, we'll clean up our acts, <laughs> literally in all conceivable ways. So this is his famous Villa Savoie in a uh, suburb outside of Paris to the west. Um, notice how it's lifted off the ground. It's trying to get away from all that dirt, right? It's floating on those pilasters. Now there's a curtain wall of glass under here. Uh, that's a clever bit of uh, optical illusion. Look at the inside of it compared to, these are apartment pictures from Paris in 1920. So same time as this house was built, this is what most people were living in. Again, it's just like crusty, right? By comparison to that other uh, approach. Here's, here's what he says. Again, quoting Le Corbusier. Teach your children that a house is only habitable when it is full of light and air, and when the floors and walls are clear. The machine that we live in now is an old coach full of tuberculosis. <laughs> an architecture that is pure, clear, clean, and healthy is what we need. Contrast that with our carpets, cushions, canopies, wallpaper, carved and gilt furniture, favored, faded and arty colors, the dismalness of our Western bazaar. <laughs> Clear it all out. Purify. I mean, this theme just keeps coming back in one form or another, right? So, if you have a powder room in your house, like near your front door you have a little half bath, just a toilet and a sink, you have Le Corbusier to thank for that. That was not a feature of most homes prior to this, but in his Villa Savoie, you walk in the front door and the first thing you see is a sink and you're asked to wash your hands before you proceed any further into his pure abode. And that became a design motif going forward to design homes that had access to cleansing facilities right as soon as you walk in. Um, this house in uh, Budapest by Alfred Luce uh, is designed with quarantine rooms built into the floor plan. Just the assumption is, we're going to hit these cycles of disease again, might as well be prepared for it, and designed with that extra space to accommodate children and others who might be sick. So this 
purified philosophy drives the majority of architecture through the middle 20th century. Uh, Mies van der Rohe, one of the principal architects of the Bauhaus, who relocates to the United States, famously designed this glass house uh, outside of Chicago, the Farnsworth House. I mean, it's beautiful, right? And, and it's minimalist purity. Don't throw stones. Um, <laughs> The United Nations is built at this time on this design philosophy. Look at the solid geometry structures of the United Nations. Look at all the clear glass. The UN is dedicated to solving global problems through reason, not warfare. And they choose an architectural style that has those same commitments. We will purify the world through our diplomacy rather than with our machine guns and bombs. Mies van der Rohe's famous Lakeshore Drive Apartments in Chicago, another classic example of this. I mean, it's now the, the vernacular language of downtown United States business district, right? I mean, you just see it everywhere, and perhaps it's so commonplace that you don't realize it hasn't always been there, right? But it has an origin point. Um, I, I include this because I live next to a guy who worked on this floor of this building for most of his career, and he loved his life working for Union Carbide. He started off driving a truck in one of their mining operations in West Virginia, ended his career up there, retired to Florida and organized employee reunions for the rest of his life. He loved him some Union Carbide. And this building was designed to induce that sort of loyalty. You are part of a rational system. Find your place and do your job with maximal rationality and efficiency. So everything in this building is on a two to five ratio. So the, the window panes are like a, a ratio of two feet wide to five feet long. It's bigger than that, but same ratio. Uh, these panels, these lights, the, the spaces between the columns, the desks in the secretarial pool, the Rolodex, the phones, like everything down to the smallest level up to the macro level has the same, it's like a fractal, right? The same pattern repeating at multiple levels. And it was meant to say, you're not really an individual. You're part of a rational whole. Don't go celebrating your individuality, because that'll get us into another world war. Focus on what we have in common. <laughs> Here in Brattleboro, your examples of international-style architecture are, what is it now, m and Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I did that right. Yeah. That was a recent change from people's. Google hasn't caught up yet. That's a Google Street grab. Um, here's what it looked like when it was built in 1958. It was the merger of a couple different banks. Um, but that was a Brattleboro, Vermont, vernacular version of this international style of architecture which was sweeping the world. Brattleboro wanted to be like New York and Paris. I mean, think about it. After World War II, there's so much building to do because so much of Europe got destroyed and so much of Japan got destroyed. There's just massive amounts of rebuilding going on. U.S. companies are getting an awful lot of those contracts to do it, so there's an explosion of wealth in the U.S and an upsurge of building here to support the corporations that are benefiting from the rebuilding the things that we helped to destroy <laughs> the site. Um, the other example is yeah. we're standing in right now. Yeah. <laughs> Brooks Memorial Library, the original library is no longer with us. Um, it was built in, I think, 1870. Um, it was a really cool building, but uh, it was torn down. And uh, now we have this on a different site than the original one. Uh, but this was built in 53, I think. Um, again, around the same time, and, and you can see, like, it's, it's a lovely space. It's, it's serving us well tonight, and on a bright sunny day, I can imagine, uh, rather than darkness and fog out there, that it's a lovely sun-soaked sort of space where you can feel like you're feeding your mind and your body, and like, so a lot of good things came out of the international style, but so too did some problems. Again, the same patterns recur where the more we're trying to move forward with this international style of development, the more we have to find places to do it, and the more that means moving existing populations out of their homes. So like Robert Moses's development projects in New York City, things like the Cross Bronx Extre Expressway, ripped through very well integrated, thriving communities and cut them off from the rest of the city. Industrial belts around Chicago protect the northern and western suburbs of Chicago from South Chicago. You literally have to cross acres of train tracks, chemical depots, and highways to move from south to north to Chicago. These were intentional moves across the United States to segregate populations. And the argument was, we're eradicating disease. This was a, a public health P 
PSA that was circulated throughout uh, the country in the 1930s uh, in advocacy for public housing projects and relocation projects uh, that primarily targeted immigrant population centers. One of the most infamous of these is called the pruitt Igo Housing Complex in St. Louis. It was built in 1951 through 1956. It was designed by Helmuth and Yamasaki. Yamasaki went on to design the World Trade Centers, which came down in 9-11. Um, and this was one of his first projects, won major architectural awards. St. Louis had a housing crisis. Affordable housing was non-existent. It was a racially segregated city. Uh, there were serious problems. And these architects came in and said, we can solve all your problems. We're going to give you these mass-produced living machines that are going to be so modern and so efficient and so cool that everyone will want to live there, regardless of race or income level or so forth. So it'll be an integrated community. It'll be an affordable community. So they raised acres of, uh, about 80 acres of existing homes in uh, St. Louis. And, and, and to be fair, those were some bleak and dire places, not too far removed from the tenement houses of New York City in the 1800s. So, like, changes needed to come. Uh, so they bulldozed developments like these and built this. So that's an 80-acre complex with all of these identically structured buildings. And just to give you some of the details here, 33 identical 11-story buildings uh, to house 12,000 people. Uh, it was following Le Corbusier's vision of rationality. So the buildings were modular in design. So even though they were composed of heavy reinforced concrete, uh, they floated on pilasters like that Villa Savoy house, lifted off the dirty earth, uh, and they're going to elevate the population of uh, St. Louis. The architect's rendering showed these common stairwells and elevator ranks would emerge into these things they called streets in the sky. They imagined like Parisian cafe street culture emerging on the 11th floor of a Pruitt-Igo building as neighbors hung out together, bathed in sunlight. Jean Cleaver is there with her stroller tending the children, surrounded by greenery. Here's what those spaces actually looked like after budget cuts and construction shortcuts. And here's what they eventually looked like. Criminals quickly realized a number of things about Pruitt-Igo. There's 33 buildings that all look the same. They all had 11 floors that all look the same. The elevators were designed to be rational and fast, so they don't all serve all the floors. So like this elevator only stops on floors 2, 3, and 9. This elevator stops on floors 5, 6, and 7, right? So you can get faster to your preferred floor. So if I'm a criminally minded individual, I think, well, I can hang out in the street in the sky and mug June Cleaver long before the cops figure out which of the 33 identical buildings, which elevator takes them to which floor, I fled the scene ages ago, right? So if neighbors don't hang out and build community, they flee quickly into their safety of their residence. The parkways between the, the lifted buildings that were imagined in the design plan were so overshadowed by these hulking concrete structures that grass wouldn't grow, uh, and they just became dirt zones. And a number of other problems. And so, so this was, the ribbon was cut on this structure in 1956, and in 1972, it's dynamited, deemed unfit for human habitation. Even the most poorest and desperate residents needed to get out of there. Something went wrong. Now, there's all kinds of discussion in the architecture and urban planning literature about what led pruitt Igo to fail. And there's a number of complicated factors that we can talk about. But here's one thing we can say for sure. The designers were too idealistic. They were convinced that their rational philosophy would purify us all and make us lovely, rational, perfect communities. And the buildings just didn't do that for us, right? Could the buildings, in combination with other social reforms, maybe have had an impact? But the buildings themselves couldn't do it. And that's what Le Corbusier, that's what Mies van der Rohe, and others believed could happen. Let me give you one other example of this, and we'll track the next frame fiber in the rope. This is the city of Brasilia, Brazil. Getting a theme here? 1950s, interesting time in architecture. Brazil decided to put itself on the map of international architecture by building a brand new capital city in the exact geographic center of Brazil, which I don't know how you figure out because it's an irregular chunk of land. But anyway, they figured out, here's the center of Brazil. It's rainforest. There's nothing there. They airlift heavy machinery and start clearing the jungle. 
and in like five years build an entire city from scratch. They hired Oscar Niemeyer uh, as an up-and-coming international style architect in Europe. He partnered with a Brazilian architect, Luzio Costa, and they built this city. Because you can only get there by flying, they made the whole city look like a giant airplane from the air. You see that? Fuselage and wings. That's the master plan for the city of Brasilia. Uh, here's a Google Maps grab recently, and you can still see uh, that structure, although it's grown a bit in the last 70 years. Um, and everything is rationalized. So the, the fuselage center is like these big green spaces. All the major government buildings are there. Uh, there's one church in the entire city. It's a temple of universal faiths. It's located there. Residential is on one wing. Commercial is on another wing. Education is somewhere else. And all of the buildings are these massive scale, like Pruitt Igo, these planned communities, efficiently produced mass production machines, right? I mean, this one terrifies me. It feels like the aliens have arrived. Uh, and they are not friendly. Um, but here's the other thing, like, all the roads are like eight-lane superhighways. Because in the future, we'll all drive cars. Who would walk in the 20th century? Please. So again, that sort of naive optimism about technology informs the entire design plan of the city. That being said, there's some beautiful moments, but it's, a bit, it's beautiful in a way like wandering through a giant sculpture garden uh, would be beautiful. So there's the, the National Library and Archives, um, can't remember, Ministry of Education perhaps is this one. So you have these sculpture-like buildings and you have these rationally planned housing blocks. There's a few problems. Let's say I live you know, here and I'm going to feed my kids, and I realize, oh shoot, we're out of bread. Well, there's not a store down here. The shopping is like on the other wing. So I've got to come down my elevator, find my car in the parking lot, get on the eight lane superhighway, traverse the wing across the fuselage to the shopping centers, get the bread, go back, you know, five hours later. <laughs> my kids have starved to death, right? Um, the other thing is there are no sidewalks in Brazil, there are no pedestrian crosswalks. There are no footbridges. There are eight-lane superhighways with cloverleaf exchanges, period. Are you familiar with the concept of desire lines? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Behind our building. Talk to me about it. What is it? Uh, well, the path from the parking lot in the back is this curving, partly to get the, the um, drop not to be too steep for a wheelchair. Everybody walks, well, a lot of people walk along the side of the building. And it... So you can see this, like, beaten path in the grass where people actually want to go versus where the designer told them to go, right? And sometimes people give in and say, well, everyone wants to go there, so we'll put a sidewalk there. Sometimes they put a fence there, right? So I'm going to highlight some desire lines in the fuselage section of Brasilia. <laughs> That's where people are trying to go, and then they've still got to cross major traffic zones in all those red line spaces. Brasilia has the highest pedestrian fatality rate in the world because of this. And, of course, here's the thing. This is the seat of government. So all the government officials hate living there. So they fly in on private jets, do their government business in the course of three days, and get the hell out uh, as quickly as possible. And meanwhile, the people who clean this place, cook the food, et cetera, drive the, the public transportation and taxis and so forth, they can't afford to live here. So they live in shanty towns outside of the city, which if you look at this on Google Maps, zoom way out, and you'll see just... The entire city of Brasilia is now ringed with tin-roofed home-type favela structures where the actual people who keep Brasilia going live, not the people for whom Brasilia was supposedly designed. So, again, we have lovely things like the Brooks Memorial Library emerge from this, and we have some kind of nightmare scenarios emerge from this at the same time. So let's just sort of recap some lessons of this. Modernism believes there's a one-size-fits-all to humanity's problem. One-size-fits-all solution to humanity's problems. Reason and technology are going to lead us to this solution. And purity is the goal and the means of human improvement. Purify the architecture. Purify the, the philosophy. Purify the politics. So, uh, I'll do, uh, I'll do the um, no, it's all good. No, no, this talk of purity and modernism, kind of, it kind of, it makes me wonder how it survived World War II, because the fascists were always talking about purity and the racists. Indeed, and so those uh, 
the futurists that I showed you that are like worshiping the electric light bulb and, and worshiping progress and all this, they said this, war is the world's only hygiene. The best way to clean things up and purify this globe is just fight it out. And we'll get rid of the unwanted population in the process. Guess whose side they were on in World War II? Uh, they were the architects for Mussolini uh, in Italy and other places occupied by the fascists. Uh, they were the ones who designed the massive stadia for the Nazi gatherings and so forth. So they actually believed that purity was actually being lived out the right way during those wars. Others, so, so you would think, like, wow, lesson learned, let's not do that again. But coming out of it, ironically, you get this, like, no, they just were wrong about how to get to purity, and we can do it better. Which seems like a bit naive in <laughs> hindsight, at least, right? Problems. Human diversity is not accounted for or respected if you're pursuing this one-size-fits-all. I mean, this is exactly what we're talking about, right? Usually, your model of purity ends up looking an awful lot like yourself. And those who are not like yourselves are deemed the impure, the contagion. Reason and technology are great servants and terrible masters, right? We can do wonderful things with modern technology and the, the, the tools of rational thinking. If we say they cover everything about humanity, we end up with dystopias. And purity is an illusion. I mean, we haven't learned that lesson in the past few years. <laughs> Let's learn it now, right? Uh, everything is contaminated, but in fact, that's not a bad thing. It's actually the source of human ingenuity, creativity, innovation. It's not a problem to be eradicated socially. If you want to read more on this, there's this lovely book called Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers, by a Ghanaian philosopher, Kwame Anthony Appiah. And he just explores this theme of contamination. Like, when I say pasta, what country comes to mind? Italy. Italy, Italy did not invent pasta. It was imported to Italy from China. Italy got contaminated, right? And, like, and boy, am I glad they did. Because they did some lovely things with this new idea they, they discovered uh, through global trade, right? Mm -hmm. So like every time we interact with people globally, locally, and otherwise, we're contaminating each other at a biological level, at an ideological level, at an artistic level, at a relational level. And it can be a fabulous thing if we let it, right? So. In response to this, we experience what we call the postmodern turn in architecture in the mid 20th century. Uh, it started with a book called Learning from Las Vegas by the architects Venturi and Brown. And they noted something about Las Vegas, which was booming at this time. All the casinos are really the same. <laughs> How they differ is just the sign out front. Those flashing electric lights make the flamingo one thing and the I don't know what another one is. The Tropicana, another thing, right? Uh, so they're like, you know what's missing from modern architecture? All those glass and steel cubes? They don't talk to us anymore. They all say the same thing. The text has been so thoroughly erased that there's only one thing written on it now. And it's rationality, objectivity, universality, purity of geometry. Our buildings used to talk to us, right? So they're like, we should go back to that. So here's a house that Robert Venturi designed for his mother in the Philadelphia suburbs in 1964. If you were to ask a kid to draw a house, you would get something like this, right? And what's really interesting about this house is that it's almost like a billboard. It's so flat. It's one room deep. So he's just saying, I'm going to give you a house sign. It says, I'm a house. And you can't confuse it for a factory. Siri wants to jump in on the conversation. Uh, <laughs> You can't confuse it for a church. Like, churches used to look like churches, and barns looked like barns, and houses looked like houses, and we lost all of that with this effort to purify everything in the 20th century. So let's go back to some signs. Let's go back to contamination, multiple materials, multiple historical eras clashing and colliding. So Piazza d'Italia in New Orleans, it's got granite and stainless steel. It's got ancient Roman uh, arches next to neon lights. It's a mishmash of everything to celebrate the Italian identity of this community in New Orleans. Disney Animation Studios, designed by Michael Graves. You can see it's like a Greek temple, and where in Greek architecture you would have what are called karyotid figures holding up the pediment structure 
Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> it's a building that tells you what it's about, right? There'd be no mistaking. You wouldn't be like, is that Starbucks? No. This is a Disney thing. Something, right? So they really start playing around with the design of their building. For the sake of time, I'll skip a couple examples here. Uh, here's the headquarters of the PPG Glass Company in Pittsburgh. Uh, what does it look like? What do those structures remind you of? Cathedral. Cathedral. Castle, right? It's crenellated. It's like a gothic castle of glass from which to rule an empire of glass. PPG, you'll see it in the lower corner of your automobile windows. They make that. And the glass for skyscrapers. <laughs> Buildings did really bad punny during this time. This is the Centre Pompidou in downtown Paris. Um, this is a, a, a sort of ironic critique of modern architecture. Modern architects are about honesty and purity, and these guys were like, your buildings lie all the time. You hide everything. Look at that glass house. Where's the bathroom? Oh, it's hidden in the one place with solid walls. Where's the plumbing? You can't see it. Where's the wiring? You can't see it. If you want an honest building, it actually looks like this. They took all the infrastructure and hung it on the outside of the building. That's the plumbing. That's the electrical conduit. That's the elevators. That's the stairwells. Inside is a big box. All the infrastructure is on the outside. Honesty, right? Purity? <laughs> The uh, site, uh, or I mean, the best stores, it was a department store, store uh, chain, not Best Buy, but uh, it was more like a Kmart or something. And during the 70s to 80s, they played around with the idea of the big box store. So, like, the facade is peeling off of this one. This one looks like it suffered earthquake damage or something. Um, back on the front is being lifted up. This is my favorite because uh, this chunk here is on an embedded rail system in the sidewalk, and when the store is closed, it gets retracted. So it's easy to tell if they're open or closed, and then slide out, there's glass doors in here. Just playing around with the forms in ways that modernists would be like, aghast, how dare it, right? Oh yeah, there it is, closed off. And then this one, uh, it looks like you're like 20 years too late to shop here. Because uh, this is a false storefront, and then they planted a forest, and then there's the actual storefront. So you go through sliding glass doors, bing, and then you're in the woods. And then you have to traverse this little footpath, and then there's another set of doors that take you into the store. Frank Gehry's, uh, this building is now owned by Google. Giant pair of binoculars that frame the entrance to the parking garage and a conference room above it for no particular reason other than that. Right? And it just gets weirder uh, the further we go in the 90s and in the early 2000s. And then, like, if you want to see the most like over the top version of all this, it's happening in the United Arab Emirates, uh, in cities like Shanghai, in uh, Qatar, if you've been following the World Cup. I mean, they just have so much money and so few architectural regulations. You can build anything <laughs> in some of these places. And so it's like an architect's playground. Uh, so this is in Abu Dhabi, uh, this giant frame. Uh, you, it's a building. Uh, you can go inside, but it also sort of frames the city. Uh, the Jeddah Tower, the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. Some other examples. <clears throat> This is uh, Saudi Island. Uh, it's a whole arts complex uh, being developed outside of Abu Dhabi. Here's the stadiums in <laughs> Qatar. I mean, millions and billions of dollars being thrown into these projects. It's gotten so over the top and creative and excessive and impure. But notice that this has also coincided with a time in which disease has been relatively stable at least for big swaths of the globe, right? We've got modern vaccines that have effectively addressed things like polio and malaria. We've beaten back tuberculosis to near non-existence and easy treatment. So like all those factors that drove some of the purity quest are kind of off the table from the 70s through, uh, well, like the 60s through the 80s. Um, smallpox is pronounced eradicated in the end of the 1970s. Um, now, of course, AIDS is heavily circulating in sub-Saharan Africa during this time, but it doesn't get to Europe and America until the 80s. So they don't think it's a problem until then, right? But there's this prevailing sense that, like, yeah, we can do whatever we want, it's awesome. And then suddenly these things come roaring back. AIDS, SARS, MERS, COVID, 
Like, we've been hit by a variety of waves in the past few decades, right? And it starts to coincide with, yeah, the Baroque excess is continuing in places where they still feel somewhat insulated from this and have more money than they know what to do with. But other architects are starting to think about context, responsibility, sustainable development, actual full-bodied human health, not just as purify your breathing space, but how do you sustain healthy human community and interaction with one another? So, ah, I gotta do this. I'm trying to watch my clock here, but what's happening to these guys? What are they doing? Dancing. Dancing, maybe? <laughs> they could be like just been hit really hard by someone. What else? Losing their balance. Could be a really strong wind. <laughs> you might have severe allergies. <laughs> right? There's all sorts of possibilities, and we have no answers why. No context. No context. It's a totally white background, no frame. Without context, how do we make meaning? It's a big question for contemporary architects, designing for Instead of one size fits all, the same glass box, no matter when, no matter where, no matter why, it's what does this particular site need? What's its context? How do we build sustainably for this? So I'll skip some of these examples because I want to, well, here's a contextual example. The 9-11 the redevelopment site, the World Trade Center, heavily contextual. If you've been there, the reflecting pools preserve the original footprint of the foundations of the original buildings. Uh, this is the public transit hub designed by uh, Spanish architect Santiago Calatrava. Um, all of these things are contextually situated so that at 10.38 in the morning on September 11th every year, the sun slices right through this oculus, which actually is mechanized and opens. It creates this bright line of light down the center of the building, and not a single one of these other towers that have been built will cast a shadow over those reflecting pools at that time on that day every year. Like, that's intention, right? It's a form of memorializing what happened. We're not just saying, well, we'll build a generic, abstract, universal monument. Thought about what happened there, what people need going forward, the geography, the <coughs> solar landscape, etc. It does, like a symbol of peace. Yep. There's a lot of focus on green roofs and uh, vertical forests in urban development. Places like Singapore and uh, Taiwan are leading the charge with a lot of that sort of development. And then here's a project in the Bronx that kind of combines it all. This was the result of community conversations that started in the 1990s about what that community needed. And they needed a number of things. They needed access to healthy food. They're in a food desert. So obesity was a significant public health crisis. So this building has been designed with lots of stairs and very few elevators. So you actually have to physically move to move through this building, although it is fully accessible for those who need it as well. All the roof areas are given over to actual gardens. There are herbs, vegetables, fruits, all sorts of things growing for the residents of these buildings. And it's a mixed use, fully affordable. It's solar, it collects rainwater, uh, it's completely renewable. It's a master plan of all these different elements designed for that community in the Bronx because of what they told the designers they need. And it's been wildly successful in the past decade uh, since it was built. In uh, Chile and Mexico, some sustainable designers have started building sort of half houses that are fully livable but expandable in future. So they're <laughs> easily accessible. So you, you buy one of these and you have, you live in here, while you have that side vacant, but eventually you can fill that in and build what you need uh, as your life takes root and your community develops. <laughs> Here in Burlington, or uh, Brattleboro, you've got some contextual development going on. I hope I'm not starting some sort of political firestorm <laughs> controversy by uh, bringing these examples in, but uh, the designers at least tried to do some of the things that we were just talking about, right? So the co-op uh, plaza over there, uh, just down the road, has won some uh, architectural awards for its uh, inclusion of accessible housing, its commitment to the environment through solar and uh, permeable surfaces, it brings together local businesses, it has the market, uh, and then the proposed redevelopment for uh, the Arts Center, uh, I don't know if you've seen that plan, uh, this was generated in 2019 and then COVID has kind of put pause on all of that, uh, but one day they hope to 
bring this to life, which will be an art museum with very permeable walls. Uh, it'll include a canoe launch and a river walk, uh, as well as a cafe, uh, housing, commercial real estate, multiple things going on in a building that kind of blends with the rest of the community, but also stands out as its own thing. So here's my questions for you, with however long you want to hang out and talk, like I'm here all night. So uh, <laughs> Star and others may have thoughts about when we need to do that. But uh, how do you think urban design will change going forward? What are those parts of the text that will stay unerased as we write the next pages of our architectural history? How will the fibers in that rope change? as a result of the last few years that we've been living through. I just read that office buildings in downtown cities are at half vacancy compared to being at 95%. Yeah. I'm sorry, um, only 5% vacant beforehand. Yeah. And it seems like this is just kind of continues. So, so yeah. I don't know how they'll change the buildings, but except their interiors, they may become residential. Good. So like Midtown Manhattan, commercial real estate is probably never going to be the same major corporations for whom that was a status thing to have real estate there are now giving their employees permission to work remotely indefinitely. So what's going to come of those buildings? And what does that entail for those remote working employees about their own home design? Mm -hmm. What else? Yeah. In the back, yeah. In Brattleboro, <clears throat> a number of years ago, recently, uh, a new building was built, a major important building, function and size. Um, however, in order to build that building, they choose, chose to put it on the site of where I think the oldest house in Brattleboro stood. And they chose, for whatever reasons, to not try to move the house to another location and preserve that house. <laughs> they tore it down. Um, I'm confused, if not a bit bothered, by the disassociation with history and with past. And um, I don't know, what to, it, it confuses me. Yeah, I mean, we see those kind of choices all over the place. And I mean, the streetscapes of uh, Vermont look different than they did 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and sometimes those are choices developers make. Sometimes there's community activism that prevents that, but uh, yeah. How do you think uh, that the pandemic will influence those sorts of things? Uh, the two things that I thought about when you were going over this was one, way, way back uh, in the 1860s, I think, is Brussels. They just covered up the Seine because it was so dirty. It used to flow right through Brussels, and they filled it all in. A lot of the pictures that you showed of um, the sewer systems and building the like those big the under Chicago, yeah, um, it looked a lot like that. Like they just they filled it all oh. in and then they cobbled it over, and now the Seine goes around Brussels wow. instead of through it. So the Boston's Big Dig project has nothing on right Brussels, yeah. Um, and then the second thing I thought of. With Brasilia is uh, this project that's proposed for Saudi Arabia called the Line. Oh yeah, which is like a miles long, mirrored glass, uh, horizontal skyscraper. Yeah. It's it just stretches out through the desert with the water at this end, and then it cuts into the mountains, so people can choose which part of it they want to live based on their climate preferences. But it's supposed to have like neighborhood blocks in it that are stacked Walk vertically. And it's why it's walkable. You'll have your grocery store, your all of your amenities, plus your neighborhood things in it. Um, but I think about Brasilia, and I think about the the blocks in the neighborhoods and the lack of the grass they could grow. And you know, it seems like these cycles will continue to repeat themselves. And there's a common theme here in the sense that like this is a Saudi crown prince with way too much money trying to make his mark as a new power player. And so when that's the motivation, inevitably, <laughs> it goes badly for someone. So yeah, there's a lot of debate about whether the mile will ever get built, uh, or the line will ever get built. But if it does, expect some problems, I would say. It seems very Blade Runner. Yeah, right? <laughs> yes? 
So one of the obvious things with COVID was uh, just ability to have outdoor dining. Yeah. And a town like Brattleboro was re we're really constrained, and narrow uh, downtown yeah, without big streets. sidewalks and and uh, so lots liquor. of other towns. <laughs> often, you know, just they had places you could go easily and, and eat outdoors, and it was it was tough for us. And there are a number of cities that just reclaimed uh, streets from cars and made them full pedestrian zones with outdoor yeah. seating and, and so forth. <clears throat> and I'm interested to see if those last or if they just get quickly reclaimed by the automobile as soon as <laughs> more people are commuting back to work or something. Mm -hmm. But yes, not every, so I mean, this is a great illustration of the question of access and equity, right? Like not every community can immediately create spaces for outdoor dining because of geography, because of weather, because of economics, like there's a lot of factors that could make it a lot easier for one community to adapt to the pandemic and much harder for another. So do you think this pattern that I've highlighted over and over again is just gonna repeat? Do we have a hope of breaking the cycle, doing things differently? Did we learn anything from sort of staring ourselves in the mirror? There were so many articles written in the early days of the pandemic about this changes everything. Life can't just go back to normal. <laughs> Have we raced back to normal? No. Can we build something different? The Ukraine. One of the things that uh, 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 when you mentioned the glass box to monitors, I feel like in some ways that is coming back a little. I work in Wilmington and they built themselves a public safety um, building for like police and fire and whatnot. And it's very boxy and mm. very glassy. And um, I also thought of the trend of turning old mills yeah. into residential buildings. Those are all boxy glassy, and that's very trendy right now. It's only one of those old mills. It's true. Now, the, the pure modernists would have torn down that mill and built a strict steel and, cube, and glass cube. But you're right that the design motifs have become a part of the palette that contemporary architects can work with. Uh, to design new structures, and so we see that modernism, it, that's the irony of it, right? They thought, we've ended architectural history. Nothing ever has to be different going forward. We won't see styles change by generation or by decade, and instead they've just become another design motif with a shelf life that you can recycle at Ikea or in the latest development in Wilmington or something like that. Yeah? I'm curious what you think the pandemic that we're also living through at the moment of addiction and you know all the consequent problems what do you think that's going to have an effect on our architecture and our you know design and, and what might that be yeah that's a fascinating question i mean there's a sense in which it's multiple pandemics simultaneously pandemics of structural racism pandemics of opioid uh, addiction pandemic of actual disease uh at the viral level um and they're overlapping intersecting realities like they're not separable from one another so I think a solution to one entails an addressing of the other. You can't just tease them apart and say, we're going to make a biologically pure containment structure here. Because, you know, for reasons that we've just discussed, that won't be for everyone, <laughs> right? Uh, so then that brings in the questions of who's included, who's excluded. So, yeah, I think it's, it's the kind of, uh, you know, the, the Bronx project that I showed you, I think is one of the better examples of trying to think holistically about the, the web of intersectional uh, oppressions and coming up with a solution that holds promise for multiple of those um, with the recognition that it's ultimately no building is ever going to solve everything. And yet, again, the tools, right? So how do we design the best tools and how do we use them most effectively and inclusively? Um, so yeah, that's a great, point to make because that's the, the pattern, right? It's, we're going to solve the health problem, but it's going to come at the expense, it's going to be for the Bostonians at the expense of the Abenaki. It's going to be for the uptown Manhattanites at the expense of the Italian immigrants and on and on the pattern repeats. So how do we break that cycle? And yeah, the theorization of intersectionality is an important tool that identities create multiply overlapping and reinforcing oppressions. So racial identity, gender identity, sexual identity, and so forth, you can experience those in overlapping ways and your life is worse because you share multiple of those identities. And if we don't start thinking that way about our design, uh, we won't solve the problems, we'll just replicate the pattern. Mm -hmm. I saw a hand over here and then we'll go here. Yes? 
So one of the things I noticed about uh, Brattleboro is they're building this bridge over here. And you didn't really talk about bridges, but in a lot of the bigger cities, which you see like people from Baltimore, or if you've ever been there, it's, a, it's all these bridges. Yeah. In the city, what was before is there Because trying to change all these buildings, it's ridiculous. So to, to get around that, that's what's happening right there. You see that bridge is going to replace these two bridges. Oh, interesting. I'll have to look at that in the daylight tomorrow. And it, they're building right now at night. Wow. And it's happening. Yeah. I, I, I get, I, bridges are a crucial part of this whole narrative. Like, here's, here's one great way of illustrating that. Going out of Manhattan toward uh, Westchester County, toward Connecticut, toward Long Island, where the more desirable properties and beachfronts and so forth are, the bridges over the expressways to those locations were built intentionally too low to allow a public city bus to fit under it. Mm. Huh. And it's still there today, right? So I mean, that's when we talk about structural racism, that's what we mean, right? It's like, those bridges are still there, even if the people planning the city of New York think differently than Robert Moses or others thought decades ago, the bridges are still there, so what do we do about access? And, and who, who do they separate from whom? What do they make available to one population at the expense of another? So yeah, I mean, questioning the structure of bridges and which communities they go through and which communities they connect, uh, it's all part of the puzzle. So another thing I wanted to mention about that bridge was down in, in Washington, I'm from Washington, D.C. Down in Washington, D.C., they built on the riverfront, and that's real estate, right? Yeah. But it, it's in water. So they built this whole wall out on the water. Wow. And they, didn't, they don't have to consult with people who have been living here for many, many years, because after you deal with them, they just and need a little piece of land to put the footing. Right. <laughs> and then they build this massive structure, like you said, on those posts. Yeah. Like you see yeah. in North Carolina or something. But you can't do nothing about it. You right. You can't stop that. Yeah, I think LaGuardia Airport is built in the water. It's really scary, yeah. <laughs> You know. But that's, that's how change happens in cities that have already been planned and built. You can't go around carrying those old buildings down because People Unless you do set. dramatic damage to existing communities. <laughs> you can go right over them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and um, forgive me if this is going a bit off topic, but I think um, just talking about kind of the most recent, um, I guess, section of the road uh, in which wellness and sustainability and uh, environmental resilience is kind of baked into the architectural language that most designers feel compelled to speak uh, in this moment. So as somebody in that industry, um, I do see a lot of what um, can be called greenwashing, in which you know beautiful renderings are generated with incredible vertical gardens and you know trees on rooftops, and it's going to be this beautiful, like technologically based, compassionate ut utopia that uplifts you know historically oppressed populations. But you know you're going to put people into these buildings. And then what, are you, what is the follow through? Like what, yeah. because I think it's not enough now as I think the past couple of years have shown us to just to take into account physical, geographical, locational context. There's cultural context as well. If you take a population of people who've historically been, you know, been, you know, prohibited from owning land to till and then give them a bunch of, a bunch of gardens, it's like, well, then what are they going to do with the gardens? True empowerment comes from education and advocacy and not just pretty buildings. So um, I realize exactly. this, that, that this perhaps doesn't tie into the pandemic specifically, but to a lot of the cultural issues that were stirred up during the pandemic. But yeah. it's all intertwined. Absolutely. So like, I think you've named something really important to us, not repeating the pattern that I've been naming throughout the evening. And that is like, the greenwashing is just another version of repeating the pattern, right? It's actually allowing wealthy developers to have their way with a certain project and satisfy the activists or the, you know, the city regulations. We put solar panels on it. Exactly. So yeah. <laughs> and that's why I chose this example because it's been around long enough to see if the concept has actually worked. And at least for a decade now, it seems to be thriving. And I think the key to its success speaks to to your concern. There were two decades of community involvement and activism and empowerment and education, they shaped this design themselves, the folks who now live in the building. And so they wanted the gardens 
and they are committed to maintaining them and, and making them available as a resource to new residents as they move in. So there's an ongoing, there's a culture that accompanies the building that has a, an intentional plan for its own reproduction. Because uh, otherwise, you throw up the structure, throw a whole bunch of people in it and say, good luck. And then be like, oh, 10 years later, it's a mess. Well, those people. That's how you got another crew when I go. Those people can't be trusted with, you know, that's why we can't have nice things. Sort of logic prevails. And so a lot of the early response to Pruitt Igo when it was dynamited was blaming the population who were housed there instead of blaming the city planners, the, the flawed designs, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, you're pointing us in the direction of a holistic solution. And I think the community conversation has to be part of that from its inception through its perpetuation if it's going to be successful. Not a thought of my own, but a question for you. Um, will there be any changes in building design to promote ventilation? We're seeing a lot of that. Uh, so, like, one of the things that got eradicated by the modernists was what we call vernacular architecture, which is, like, the regional variances. Like, a, a building in New Orleans looks different than a building in Vermont for obvious reasons of weather, <laughs> right? Sure. Like, there's all those balconies and open air spaces. You've got these giant windows and really tall ceilings to push the heat up, big paddle fans, and then you've got louvered shutters when the hurricanes arrive or to keep out the harsh sun, and you don't see that on a Vermont home. Instead, you see thick insulation and <laughs> smaller windows, especially if you get into Canada, it's even more that way. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of rethinking the vernacular, because ironically, in the name of purity and health, modernist buildings are completely sealed and closed structures. You can't open the window of a skyscraper. Uh, and so it's all recirculated air that is not actually open to the outside except through mechanical exchange systems. And so it actually exacerbates pandemics that are airborne <laughs> instead of curing them as promised. So there's a lot of move to designing buildings with uh, permeable uh, envelopes, with reconfigurable wall spaces. So like in your own home, if you had to work from home, you might have found yourself trying to find that quiet space for a Zoom meeting while your kids are <laughs> running around in the background and you wish you had an office you could just close off. So there's like, you know, learning from Japanese architecture with slidable walls to reconfigure space, learning from New Orleans architecture about how to do uh, ventilation without mechanical systems. So yes, uh, a long minute answer to your question. Absolutely, there's a lot of exploration of that right now. No, um, I'll keep it short. Um, so I'm from the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, and St. Paul, which, speaking of vernacular architecture, we have these things called skyways, which are about two to three stories off of the ground, yeah. and they're like a little tunnel with glass on either side that connect skyscrapers together. So in the wintertime, when you need to get from the General Mills building to the Target building, you can just walk through a sort of indoor mall that is built up like, <clears throat> like the malls in the subways of New York, right? Or in Japan, like the... Or Montreal's underground city. Right. Yeah. Um, but then the pandemic comes, and people are like, oh no, I don't want to be inside a glass tube with a bunch of other people who may or may not be sick. I want to go back out to the street. Well, the city had not made any plans to yeah. redesign the streets, except for one main boulevard, which, which was like the mall, that they had aimed to redesign because the X Games were coming to the new stadium that had been <laughs> built um, in an area of town that had been heavily redlined in, you know, the yeah. 50s through 80s. Um, so the redevelopment plan to connect these communities back together, uh, like the Black Bottom neighborhood in Detroit, <coughs> Cleveland basically got cut in half, a lot mm -hmm. of the, like, uh, predominantly black neighborhoods just got decimated by highways. Yeah. Um, All across America. Right, and that, so now there's this urban planning design to try to build land bridges to reconnect these spaces back together. Um, but the danger there is that it's not, it's going to be a place like Central Park where the people with the money move to this spot that's got a nice green <laughs> space and they push out the people who this new thing is for to sort of like undo a harm, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that, I think that that seems like a really difficult challenge, is that how do you not repeat those mistakes? How do you redevelop without gentrifying? Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, we are not going to answer that question tonight, and I, I probably have kept you up past your bedtime, hearing my own, for sure. So thank you all for being here and for your great questions and comments.